is a drought. She is the ground coordinator for the Utah Division of Water Resources. Uh, we have nem Nemesis, Nemesis Ortiz Declet over here, um, and she is a drought and conservation <laughs> programs coordinator for the Arizona Department of Water Resources. And then over here, we have Jimmy Emmons. He is the owner of Emmons Farm and Emmons Ventures of Oklahoma, Western Oklahoma, and coordinator for the Soil Health Mentoring Program at Oklahoma Conservation Commission. So first of all, we'll go ahead and we'll hear from Laura. We've asked each of these presenters to just prepare a, a brief um, overview of how they handle drought, what are some of the decisions they make, and uh, so on and so forth. So Laura. So um, I am with the division, the Utah Division of Water Resources, and our mission is to plan, conserve, develop, and protect Utah's water resources. And so a lot of what I'm going to say, Brian, I, we should have learned more from Brian because the lessons we learned are that we can't afford to be in our silos anymore. And as a state, we have a lot, we have a lot of different agencies and people who work on wildfire, and people who work on our parks and our recreation and our agriculture and as in water resources. And we were all in these meetings and we didn't know what other people were doing with drought and how they were affecting them. And last summer, the Great Salt Lake reached, well, it was actually in the fall in October, it reached a new record low elevation. And we have a um, record going back to 1847. We have a pretty good period of record. And that was significant. And um, so we, we are really, it got people attention and got people working. And we, we were working kind of before that, but uh, one thing we learned is that we have this drought reporting committee, and that is who will actually make a recommendation on, say, a drought declaration to the governor or the legislature. And it used to be this thing in the right in the right hand corner there that's this complicated. Every single one of those boxes was a different like agency or organization, and you don't need to read those. But it involved all these different agencies, and there are these task forces. They were supposed to meet separately, and we, it seemed like a really good idea because we would be gathering all this information from all these different places. But it just was too big and too wieldy, and it it um, people had a lot of turnover, and so we were always you know trying to restaff everything. So we've changed it to this, where there's seven agencies that meet, and it's working so much better. Uh, these are like really high level department head kind of things at these agencies so that they can make decisions so that they can speak for that agency. And because there are just those seven organizations in there, then if, you know, things happen like um, wildfire was talking about something and so that agriculture could say, well, we're having some training and we might want to, we could bring up to our agricultural community that you know we want to be careful as we do burn on their property. And there's a lot of collaboration in this meeting. And so it's working really, really well. As far as messaging, that is a big one that we that I work on. And um, it's never too early to plan. Um, that is something we found that we have to start planning in about October if we would like to make the declaration in April. And the declaration can be made kind of any time in, in Utah, but the timing on that is really important because people, there's a lot of media around it and a lot of hype. And so we want it to get out where it's going to be most effective and we want people to be acting and changing their behavior. And this is kind of an example of every two weeks in the summertime, we will put out a media release. And that was a big thing. Each of those seven agencies that I showed earlier has a public information officer now. I uh, didn't used to, but now we do. And so they all work together and they all meet and they collaborate on this media release and they have a little sound bite that the media can pick up. So if it's a slow media day and 
you all get calls like, hey, can we do a media interview in an hour? And it's sometimes I wonder if we really want PIOs because we never used to get that before, but um, we are getting a lot of media attention and it's good because they've really helped us get message out that we want to get out there. And it is a combined and coordinated effort where the media might come and they will interview someone from about wildfire and someone from the parks department like at the same time, right? In the same place the way they're building from the same building. And we try and pick a focus because water conservation is so big that we um we work on like we'll say, okay, outdoor watering, it might be the big thing, or maybe we want it to be wildfire, be careful about that. And so because if you give too much information and just get lost in the shuffle. So we pick a focus and then we work on that. And then we see the opportunities like the Great Salt Lake getting to a record low elevation level is necessarily a good thing, but we can use that and we can say, you know, we are in a drought, if it matters, that's downstream. So the more we take out upstream, you know, and just, just get the message out and see, you know, anything that comes up, we have some pretty, Big creative ideas right now, you know, which is idea to pipe water from the ocean to the Great Salt Lake. And you don't have to comment on if you think that's a good idea or bad idea. You just say, hey, you know, that's, I mean, we're so glad that people are aware that we're in a drought and get your message out and, and go around what, what the topic is because I don't make decisions about piping water like that. So um, this is, um, being updated right now. So, oh, it actually has the old slide. Sorry about that. Um, we This was supposed to go live yesterday, but our uh, we have a new website. And I'm really excited because right now the Utah.gov reroutes to water resources and only water availability. But we have this new website that as soon as our IT department at the state gets it live, it's ready to go. And it'll be a one-stop shop where anybody can go with any of their draft questions about recreation, about agriculture, it has links for grants or um, lower use agricultural stuff, um, water, water conditions and fire restrictions, everything is on that one page. And that is another way we're trying to get, um, be more friendly to the public. The thing that we, we're still struggling with. We are working really, really well as agencies and as you know, working in the state, but we have a lot of local water providers, and some of them are bigger water providers with good websites and, and a lot of team that we can communicate with pretty well. And then some are very, very small and might say things like, well, you know, we're gonna put a notice up at the post office of when we want you to change your watering or something. And we're We'd like to put those on this website, but we just haven't figured out how to do that yet because there's just so many. And they're um, not only is there so many, but they, the way they communicate isn't easy for us to access. So that's something we're still still learning. Um, as far as sharing information, they asked how I share information, and I thought, well, I don't really very well. I'm pretty bad at that, so maybe I should change that. <laughs> but when I started and I was learning. I looked at websites of agencies that did things similar to what I was trying to do. And the Drought Learning Network was really, really helpful to get me connected with people who do the same thing as I do or who I could learn things from. Webinars, when I first started watching the webinars, I would maybe understand about 10 minutes of the <laughs> webinar out of an hour. And now I'm, I'm learning, I'm following it better. So don't get discouraged if you do it in your not understanding the whole thing. And this peer-to-peer, staff-to-staff, when you start getting upper management involved, especially when you're talking between agencies, sometimes people can be kind of careful about what they say, you know, we have water rights between the states and different things. And so just do it staff-to-staff. -staff. You can communicate a lot better that way. And I think there are questions. So there's my contact information. All right, next up we have Jimmy Emmons and he's going to be sharing uh, his wisdoms. I don't know how 
how much wisdom it is, but uh, things that we've tried to learn over the past uh, few years in Oklahoma and in surrounding uh, states uh, is that, and Brian kind of touched on the, the drought periods that we go through, that we've learned that producers tend to react slowly. Uh, if you're in a three to five year drought period, what we see is producers take the first year, well, it's a little dry, you know, uh, but it's going to rain again. Thanks are we still have grass, we still have crops. Year two comes along, uh, they start realizing it's a little dry, uh, but they really don't start thinking about reducing cow herds. Uh, what we, can we do to save water yet? It's just kind of in their mind, you know, pray for rain, it'll get better. Time we'll get to year three, things are getting real serious. And then they go into reaction mode. And uh, well, we're halfway through that drop period already. So that's things that we got to re realize that, and I'm a producer, so I'm one of them. So I can talk about it. So it, we tend to react slow. Uh, and, and the public's the same way. Uh, you know, you, I drove in yesterday from uh, Oklahoma City, and it, you don't have to really look around very long to realize that it's very brown and very dry past Amarillo, clear down to here. But once again, you see a lot of people in cities and stuff still overwatering their yards and doing things. So they're just like producers, they tend to react slowly. So I think that's things that we need to try to work on, bring awareness out and, and try to get people to be proactive. Uh, you know, grazing land and production lands, producers really need to understand the why the soil health and how important it is to understand the destruction that we've done over the past 150 years in grazing management, in tillage and farming practices, uh, and how that we really improve that to help us in this dry periods that we go through. Uh, a lot in Oklahoma, and part of my job is uh, the tribal members as well. We have a lot of tribes in, in Oklahoma and they really started coming around in the last year, year and a half to really start working on their tribal lands uh, for better grazing management and better, better uh, farming practices with their uh, people that do the farming there. So I think we've made great strides uh, with them as well. Uh, the media, I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, and much like what you're doing, we started uh, with the Conservation Commission that, through our social media package, uh, and that's multiple outlets, where it be Facebook, Twitter, uh, TikTok now, uh, different things. Uh, really what we're doing, and what that's really helped us, uh, along with the media start noticing that. And so Ron Hayes with the Radio Oklahoma <laughs> Network who reached out to us, and I'm trying to do about once a month a spot with him on the radio about what we're doing at the commission, and what I'm doing as a mentoring lead uh, for producers in this drought time period. Uh, also, our media uh, person sends that out, uh, and RFD picked up uh, that we were doing them spots with Ron, and actually we made a RFD D television a couple of times. Uh, with that spot. And so a lot of producers uh, really watch uh, RFD uh, TV. And so we found that that's going to be a very helpful uh, program for us to get that out. You know, and I talk about this a lot, and uh, how do we catch it all? Uh, when, when, when I get a rain at home, <laughs> Noble Research, Jim Johnson and I were really good friends. He said, what you need to start telling everybody is when they ask you how much rain you got, you, you need to say, I got it all. And, and that's the, the big thing that, that we've really been focusing on is how do we get our soils, how do we get our land to be able to take all we can. Now, in the big flooding situation, we know that we're not going to get it all. But in these localized events, if I can raise, and I have on my farm, raised my infiltration rates from a half inch an hour, but well over eight inches an hour. 
So if I do have that localized event, if I can capture half, two thirds, or three fourths, or even all of it, then that gives me a, a really advantage down the road. To get producers to understand that is a, a, a very big challenge because when you go through life so slowly in time period and we're, we think that we've been here a long time but in, in the big scheme, we're, we've been here a short period of time. The, the key is you don't see them changes happening. The, the destruction of the land, the destruction of the water infiltration rates that we went through. So that awareness is gonna be really key up front to the next generation here of how we get, uh, how do we catch it all? I think it's gonna be very important because we've done a really good job uh, and, and for thousands of years, people have uh, caught water, whether it be in pots, tubs, barrels, impoundments, dams. We've done a great job of, of capturing, but we didn't catch it where we needed to. And that was on the land itself and on the rangeland and on the farm ground. So I, I think that's part of the process that awareness that we also got to go through is it's not about uh, piping water from the ocean to the lake. It's how do we get the system to function right so that that water comes back naturally. And so in these big dry periods, you know, people say, well, it's not going to rain. But if you really look at history, and I think Brian kind of showed that in his slide there, that we do have dry periods, but then we have wet periods. And wet periods is when we can really uh, take advantage of that and replenish and restore the, the impoundments, the land and stuff, if we get things set up right. So I think that that's going to be the key points, and that's really what I was uh, interested in this drought learning network from the day one was uh, as producers, and, and you asked the question a while ago, I, I think it's real important that we have places to go, places to look, uh, like the drought learning network, to understand the science behind what's going on. Uh, typically, we in the science world don't communicate very well. And I, I think that's something that, that this will really help with in the future in the, in the network is how do we communicate better with the public, the producers uh, on the land. Uh, I really think the avenues and the, the uh, policy side of that is going to be really important. I'll just tell Emily, we, we took after New Mexico the Healthy Soils Act, <clears throat> and we took that act back to Oklahoma. We rewrote it kind of to fit Oklahoma, and we put that out before the legislators this year. We passed the House in flying colors. We passed the Senate in flying colors. Uh, the House forgot to put the, the name of the bill along before it went over, so we had to go back. <laughs> um, we went back for a little bit uh, in the conference committee. There's no problems with just the procedure things, but we were at the end of the session, and then what happened is they were building the budget while we were in conference committee, so we missed our budget item in the budget, which is that's okay. We, we can manage that. What then happened was it went to the governor and he vetoed it. It's like, wow, we passed the house, passed it, we go back and back forth. Uh, but we were had done a really good job with the media and our legislators over the past two or three years uh, that I reached out to leadership and within 24 hours, we, we got to get our veto overridden. It became public law. Uh, immediately. So it's very important that we reach out and we, we engage them, legislators, and let them know uh, what we need, what's going on, and how we work together to get that out. And so uh, in the near future, uh, we'll be implementing that at the Conservation Commission. And uh, then I reminded them leadership that we would need dollars this next go around. And, and uh, I think we'll get that. But brought up some really good key points this morning and I think that's things we need to work on in the future.
Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nemesis Ortiz de Quet, and I am the Arizona Department of Water Resources Draft Conservation Coordinator. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here, and I will be talking about Arizona Drought and Support. So, uh, to no, as a no surprise to anyone here, Arizona has been in drought for a while. This is a depiction of drought uh, from the U.S. drought monitor showing and um, Ryan showed one for the Southwest, I'm sure one for Arizona. Uh, and as you can see, more than none, there has been drought throughout the years in 2002 and present. I want to point out specifically the 2021 period where we had exceptional drought throughout most of the year before we had a uh, wet monsoon season. And since then, just last week, we went back into exceptional it's 3% of the state's not covered. Um, this is more on the long term. Uh, this is a graph for standard precipitation and vapor transpiration index from 1981 to the present to April 2022. And as we can see, uh, drought has been present since about the 1990s, but I'll let Dr. Aaron Sapple talk more about that during the state ecologist panel. Uh, we've been in drought conditions since then, and things are not looking like they're improving. So what is the Arizona, the state of Arizona doing to mitigate those uh, drought conditions throughout the state? I would like to start with the beginning of the Arizona Department of Water Resources, the establishment of the 1980 groundwater management code. Uh, the code established five areas throughout the state. Those are the active management areas that you can see on the map. And the goal of the law is to control severe over drought water resources and to augment the responsibility. And if you're just laying it off on staff, you're going to be able to buy it. So, how can we guide? Establishes the underground water storage and recovery program. Uh, this allowed different uh, water providers to save water underground to use it in the future. And in 1996, they established the Arizona Water Banking Authority. Through 2020, the Water Banking Authority has reached over 4.46 million acre feet of access to central Arizona project water, and creating over 4.2 million acre feet of long term storage credits that can be accessed in the future. 1999, uh, Governor Janet Bain, uh, Jane D. Hall established the drought declaration in the state. Um, this declaration allowed for assistance from federal agencies and state agencies to drought stricken mm -hmm. areas and promotes conservation on different uh, levels of the state. In 2007, the declaration was reaffirmed by Governor Janet Napolitano. And further promoting those, the, the conservation of different stages and further encouraging residents, schools, institutions to conserve water and to start their drought conservation plans. In 2004, to further encourage um, drought preparedness in the state, uh, there was an Arizona Drought Preparedness Operational Plan developed by a 2003 Governor's Drought Task Force. Uh, so this plan uh, established a means to monitor drought throughout the entire, entire state to promote preparedness on different levels. And the way that we are implementing this plan is by the establishment of three groups that are key to this. The Governor's Drought Interagency Coordinating Group, the Local Drought Impact Groups on a county level, and monitor, Drought Monitoring Funding for Three. Uh, so the Arizona Department of Water Resources, promotes com uh, communication between these stakeholders, between the groups, and between the groups and policymakers and stakeholders throughout uh, Arizona. Right now, the Arizona Department of Water Resources has a drought program, which also implements this plan. Uh, so through the program, we work with the different drought groups to promote uh, drought status and preparedness communication. Uh, we, on a monthly, Basis, issue your short term drought status reports. Uh, we work with the monitor technical committee to develop these reports and to distribute them to residents uh, and anyone who's interested in them. We have uh, long term drought status reports, which are created by the state climate office, and we share reports on those on a quarterly basis. 
And through the agency, we also share data from the Uniswap monitor in an interactive graph dashboard. And this is live updated with the weekly updates from the Uniswap mm -hmm. monitor. On an annual basis, uh, the department develops an Arizona drop preparedness annual report. This is also in collaboration with straw groups. And the report includes information about drought impacts, drought preparedness, uh, weather during the past water year, and also the weather outlook into the next water year. Uh, it includes preparedness activities and even emergency designations throughout the state for that water year. This report we share with the public, and we also share with the governor's office so that leadership is aware of what's happening in terms of drought in the state. The department also has a Colorado River Management section. Uh, on the state level, uh, while Colorado River Management typically happens on a federal level, the Arizona Department of Water Resources Director, Thomas Wachowski, who is appointed by the state governor, is the representative of the state in bi-national negotiations. So we keep track in the department on the track of Colorado River negotiations, policies, um, operations and planning as well as current conditions so that we make informed decisions in, on behalf of the state. Some additional actions I wanted to share is, are that there is a 100 year water supply policy in the state. Uh, so 100 year water supply must be proven before land can be developed in urban areas and active management areas. Those are the most populated areas with the highest pressure of groundwater. And there are mandatory water conservation requirements for municipal, industrial, and agricultural users in the state. So out of, out of all these actions and policies, what have we learned? Uh, so things that have worked, definitely proactive policies have been have worked to keep track of everything happening to make sure that we are saving water before a shortage happens. Um, drought groups, partners, and collaboration such as the Drought Monitoring Technical Committee, Drought Monitoring Supporting Group and local Drought Impact Groups, and even the Drought Living Department uh, have helped to keep bring together information on impacts on the ground, on what's happening in terms of data, and on what's happening on a more local scale. And tools such as the US Drought Monitor Technologies and others such have been very instrumental in us getting the data that we need to make informed decisions and to share with the president and the public. Um, there's always room for improvement. So some things that we would like to work on are increased drought impact ground observations. I'm sure that that is something that is a challenge to all the different states throughout the Southwest. Um, and can stakeholder involvement we would like more rural, tribal, ranching, and mining sector stakeholders to join the conversations that we're having. Uh, establishment of new local drought impact groups on county scale. These are the liaisons between the department and those local communities. And something that Laura mentioned, uh, drought preparedness in a small community water systems is a challenge. When you go into rural areas, it's kind of hard to connect with those communities and how they're preparing. But I'll talk a little bit more about community water systems during the jar hotspot session. So I don't know anymore about that. And all right so we are running just a little bit behind but i'll go ahead and take maybe a couple questions maybe one through the room and one through the online yeah go ahead um man this is um great presentation everybody really learned on so much um but just a quick follow-up on your drought dashboard that you have is that at the local scale first part of the question is it does it get down to the local scale i know the, the monitor is not the course of resolution, but and then are do you have any information on producers? Are they looking at the dashboard? Are they using it? Have you got any feedback on that? So the the small scale that it gets to is county level. Mm -hmm. That's uh the small scale that the US don't want to reports on. So for the interactive dashboard, you can click on county and get the data from 2000 to the present um in terms of what percentage of drought levels they have experienced in the past and are experiencing mm -hmm. currently. We don't have any feedback yet from producers. Um, we do have members from the USDA and from Arizona Department of Agriculture. Um, and we have shown them the tool. So hopefully they can also distribute it to their stakeholders. But we haven't received um, specifics 
But this is a tool you guys created. It's it's mm -hmm. taking the information from the you don't go to the drop monitor and get that. You just get the information from the drop monitor and then you create the tool. We well, get yeah. the data and yeah. apply that to awesome. Thanks. Did we have any questions from the virtual? Um more more comments, but I can read no. them. Um there aren't any in the room. I, I think I saw hands go up in the room. So if we don't have any questions from there, yeah, let's let yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the perspective of getting into the landowner or water user um, here at Great Gator. How do we connect with those communities? You know, some of the ideas I've had are maybe going to farm bureaus to kind of get a, a larger perspective, but still at a smaller scale, going to county fairs. I mean, these are some of the things that I know living, having lived in rural communities could be a good way to connect. What are some of your thoughts? All of you, but I was just speaking directly to you, sir. <laughs> okay. Uh, what we've chosen at the Conservation Commission is uh, to do one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentoring, and uh, we, we advertise that out a lot. And so we have a team of about five of us right now. We're going to double that uh, through the Healthy Soils Act. We go out and, and, and really just talk one-on-one -on -one, uh, so we can get more in-depth and get the people that's interested and then try to get them be mentors in their uh, community and try to get that pod to grow out is what we're trying to do. We've done some one-on-one -on -one phone calls but that's a because we have some that are for the secondary water that might just go on there on people's yards and things. They it's sometimes the board of people who have a day job and then they do this at night, you know, on the side of this because they have the water themselves. And so we we made phone calls to board members of those that you know are interested in connecting and how is how are things going? Just again, kind of that one on one. That takes a lot of time. Yeah. Um, do we have time for one more question? Are we okay? We have time for one more. Go ahead. This one's for Jimmy. You, you mentioned uh, increasing the infiltration of the water to eight inches. How is that done? I'm just curious. What what. It's, it sounds like a really interesting concept of capture a lot more rain that falls. What, what do you guys do? So we're trying to regenerate that land uh, back to its original, the original organic matter in our local area was anywhere from three to 7%. Uh, most of that is a half percent, less than 1% now. And so that land has been uh, really destroyed and degraded. So that aggregation of the soil, bigger soil particles have been crushed and non-existent, uh, very low carbon content. So part of that rebuilding process is better land management, uh, better grazing, uh, no-till cover crops, build the biology back up because that is what really builds soil aggregation and stores the carbon. Once you start doing that, instead of that land being so compacted and sealed off, crusted over, a lot of producers talk about crusting. Crusting is a man-made a disaster. And, and so once you get that that aggregation built back, it becomes very porous. And so it lets gas flow in and out, oxygen flow for the microbes to breathe and exhale CO2. So as you do that, then you start building that infiltration rates back so it has the ability to take it in. And that's the part that, that is hard for producers to see. And that's what I was trying to comment on because that's happened over a hundred years. And so it's so slow that they didn't realize what they were doing. But now we know that how we can redo that. So once we do that, and we put that carbon back in, that's the natural filter for the aquifers and stuff as we're infiltrating that water back. So we're getting that back in and then the small water cycle starts working better as well. We'll see more humidity and stuff. So it's a ongoing process. It takes three to seven years to get that turned around. And in a dry area like we're in, longer because you can't grow as much. Thank you. All right. I'd really like to thank our panelists and be sure to catch up. Next up, I believe we have um, Dr. Dave Dubois.